When we say the name Pong, it instantly brings up images of a black screen with two white lines and a bouncing ball. Back in 1972, this was revolutionary. The technology needed to interact with images on a screen was mind-bending. Yet by today's standards, it's very primitive. While researching the show, I was curious to see how many lines of code it took to program Pong. The answer surprised me. Brew some coffee, pull up a chair, and open your mind. This week on Science vs. Conspiracy, we'll be discussing not Pong, but the mathematics and brain power needed to create a simulation over coffee. Hello, this is the Pacific Wellbeing Mental Health Podcast. I'm Jennifer, and starting mid-August 2022, I'm going to be bringing you podcasts discussing mental health topics, trends, controversies, and news with an eye to informing and educating you on your path to well-being. I've been working in psychology and nursing for 20 years, and now I'm a doctoral student in counseling psychology. So I have a pretty keen insight into what makes us tick. Join me every second Wednesday, and we can explore the fascinating world of mental health together. Available wherever you get your podcasts. The original Pong wasn't programmed with a traditional programming language. In fact, all the logic and graphics had been built directly into a specialized processor built out of a Texas Instrument 74000 series transistor-to-transistor -transistor logic or TTL chip. Conventional storage would have been too costly at the time. I wanted to bring up Pong as an example of what can be accomplished in a mere 40 years. We went from Pong to games like Elden Ring and Grand Theft Auto, and created spaces like the Metaverse. Simple square pixels on a screen, to fully immersive, detailed worlds. I think currently, when most people think of the concept of being inside a simulation, we tend to think about the hundreds of thousands of lines of code that goes into developing video games. In order to create a simulation that is indistinguishable from reality, the computing power needed is estimated that a kilogram of matter fully exploited for computation could perform 10 to the 50th power operations per second. What I found is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, by comparison, the human brain, which is also kilogram sized, performs 10 to the 16th power operations per second. It may be possible for a computer to simulate the human brain in real time. However, as we saw with Pong, computer scientists have developed new and better ways to create computer worlds. Also, quantum computers will revolutionize this even further. Computers today work on a binary system, ones and zeros, meaning a byte can either be a one or a zero. The difference with quantum computing is that you can have a one or a zero or both at the same time, opening up whole new worlds of possibilities. Which brings me to my next point, math. I was never good at it in school, however, math is like the Illuminati. It's everywhere and controls everything. But did humans invent math, or was it discovered? Is math constant in the universe, or is there some place where 1 plus 1 equals 14? Well, the Greek philosopher Plato, you may have heard of him, he's kind of a big deal. He thought mathematics described objects that really exist. Mathematical objects exist outside of space and time. This involves showing how one thing in the world depends on another. Take for example honeycombs. Bees create a hexagonal honeycomb inside the hive. In mathematics, hexagons are the most efficient shape to fully cover a surface while keeping the total length of the perimeter to a minimum. Charles Darwin explained that the bees have evolved to use this shape because it produces the largest cells to store honey for the smallest input of energy to produce wax. Another example is the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is a set of integers, the Fibonacci numbers, that starts with zero, followed by one, then by another one, 
and then a series of steadily increasing numbers. The sequence follows the rules that each number is equal to the sum of the preceding two numbers. We observe the Fibonacci sequence over and over in nature. From branching trees, to fruit sprouts in a pineapple, the flowering of an artichoke, and the uncurling of a fern. If reality is made up of mathematical objects, it's easy to see how mathematics might play a role in explaining the world around us. Swedish-US cosmologist Max Tegmark argues that reality is one big mathematical object. If math is all around us, then are we not living in a simulation? Would this also mean that the simulation is not really a simulation at all, but in fact reality? What do we define the simulation to be? An Australian physicist philosopher Jane McDonnell agrees. However, she goes further with a more radical position. She believes that reality is not only made up of mathematical objects, but also minds. Mathematics is how the universe, which is consciousness, comes to know itself. Traditional science assumes that an objective observer independence reality exists, meaning the universe, stars, galaxy, sun, moon, earth, and more would still be there if no one was looking. On the other hand, modern quantum theory disagrees. German Nobel Prize winner Werner Heisenberg, among others, explains in quantum theory the properties of a particle do not even exist until an observation takes place. The idea of an objective real world whose smallest parts exist objectively in some sense as a stone or a tree exists independently of whether or not we observe them is impossible, wrote Heisenberg. The idealist philosopher George Berkeley argued that physical objects do not exist independently of the mind that perceives them. An item truly only exists as it's observed. Otherwise, it is not only meaningless, but simply non-existent. If reality is created by the observer, then isn't this absolute proof of alien intervention? An advanced alien race would have had to have looked up into the sky on some distant planet into our exact location and observed our galaxy, sparking our existence. To help maximize the computing processing power and to create a better gameplay, only parts of the game that the player observes are rendered. This is the same concept that Heisenberg was describing about our own reality. It appears that math is found everywhere in the universe, and only objects being observed exist. Then there should be no difference between what we define as reality and that of the simulation. But what do we define the simulation to be? The technical definition of the simulation is imitation of a situation or process. So is our reality an imitation? At least to me, it seems like we're existing in some sort of computer. And I use the term computer loosely here. But are we being simulated? That one I'm not so sure about. Two things come to mind. How advanced would the program running the simulation would have to be? And if we knew we were in a simulation, it brings into question the idea of free will. I'll get into these in more detail next week, but for now, does this make what we're all experiencing any less real? Would this knowledge change the way we live our lives? Perhaps for some. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. If you liked the video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and turn on those notifications. That way you'll be notified every time we release new content. Uh, we try to release new videos every Monday and our podcast goes up on Fridays. So that's it for this week. Remember, being paranoid is smart and we'll see you next time. This week's episode of Science vs. Conspiracy Over Coffee was produced by Lethologica. Research and writing is done by Bob Homer and Jennifer Timer.